I have a lot of viewers that are interested in raw food diets with mm -hmm. just uh, raw fresh fruits and vegetables. And, yes. Um, as I was reading the pleasure trap, I, I noticed you have three factors of why people do things the way they yes. do them. And so one is uh, seek pleasure, avoid mm -hmm. pain, and energy conservation. And I was yes. just thinking um, having a raw fruitarian diet, would that cover all of those uh, factors, do, would you say humans are designed for that type of diet or what is your take on that? Yeah, they, um, they're not designed for that diet. The, um, it, it's it's going to turn out that we're designed for a diet with cooked food in it. Mm. And so this started about two million years ago and you can actually see the morphological changes in the human chest cavity that, uh, and an extraordinary reduction in the size of the stomach. So, um, and the, the reason why the stomach sh uh, shrank in our species over the last two million years is because of the use of cooked food. If you look at the, um, our, our stomach has about one third the surface area of a chimpanzee, which is an equivalent size primate. Right. And, um, and the reason why that's true is that uh, the chimpanzee doesn't have a large stomach, they have a typical stomach for primates. And um, uh, the reason is, is that that the, they need a, a normal sized stomach in order to process the amount of vegetation that is necessary for them to survive on a raw food diet. And so uh, they are, uh, the average chimpanzee is actually chewing about six hours a day. That's what they do. Uh, the average human being chews for about one hour a day. Okay, so there's a big difference in literally the time that's involved in eating. And that time reduction is the, the processing uh, of the food that is done through cooking. That's actually what caused that difference. Wow. And, uh, and so as with the, uh, our jaw is actually quite a bit different. It's not nearly as strong as a chimp. Uh, I have it on good authority from primatologists that I know that, that they say if you've ever been kissed by a chimp, you'll never forget it. <laughs> they're, they're so much stronger. Their lips are so much stronger than humans. It's freaky. And, uh, and this is the equivalent sized animal to us. Um, yeah, so it, it's going to turn out that our diets have actually gotten so soft, but well, let me, let me follow this argument a little further and then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about the over softness of the human diet. So the, um, the human diet, uh, was designed by nature to have large amounts of raw food in it because it would, and then a substantial amount of cooked food and the cooked food would have Probably, well, we actually know it would have primarily been uh, root vegetables uh, is what it was. Uh, it was primarily, you know, potato-like things in the, in the ground in Africa. And um, so what, what happened is this, this actually is, is how, in fact, human nature was born, was born behind the advent of fire. Fire is the, is the singular tool that actually changes the course of human evolution and causes us to be human. This is what happened, that, that starting about two million years ago, uh, at that time, human, human, uh, human uh, proto-humans, uh, Australopithecus, was, was not a pair bond species. In other words, there was no long-term relationships between, in the mating uh, between male and female. There were no, so there were no families. Uh, what there were was a standard operating procedure, which is true for 97% of mammals which is that the, the males do no, did no paternal investment in the offspring whatsoever. So the females would be in charge of their, of their children and they would feed them and raise those children and would take them many years to do so. Now, when you have children, you can imagine that you cannot possibly hunt. There's just no way that organism can hunt. And so that species was designed as a raw food vegan species is what it was. Wow. The males were also a raw food vegan species. In other words, they did not, they didn't have specialization that the males could go off and hunt while the females were gathering berries and eating roots. All, all of the, the species, the entire species, simply ate the same food. The males were, and they were eating probably for six hours a day. They were like foraging all the way, you know, they were literally eating six hours a day and then the other half of the time they were moving from one spot to the other to get the food. So in other words, they're basically eating all day long is, is what's happening. Now, starting about two million years ago, they started to use fire. And uh, this is extraordinary. So what would have happened is that um, 
the females would have been for the first time able to start to uh, uh, to use uh, root vegetables. Now, root vegetables are much higher in calories than than eating fruit, fruit off the vine. Fruit off the vine might be two or three hundred calories. The root vegetables are five hundred calories. So you're, it's doubling the calorie density. Now, the uh, the problem is is that you can't eat it raw. It's too it's too tough to eat raw. It's not worth the trouble. So you could eat it. You can eat a raw potato, but the amount of energy that it takes to digest it and the amount of calories that you get out of it isn't, isn't worth doing. And your intuition tells you that, which is why you don't like it. Okay? In other words, it's too hard. It doesn't taste. It's not sugary enough. Forget it. You'd much rather eat grapes. Okay? So, uh, what, however, if we cook that potato, suddenly it's a whole different story. Now it's a lot softer. Okay, and that softness means there's a lot less muscular action that's involved in its digestion. So there's much less energy required to digest that food. Okay, not only that, it's going to turn out that by cooking that carbohydrate, you actually gelatinize the starch, and you make the starch much, much. Uh, you make the calories more available and much easier to get to. So you've effectively increased the calorie density of that food considerably. Okay, the uh, not only that, you've actually lowered the amount of digestion time, so the food doesn't have to remain in the stomach as long. It's passing into the small intestine much, much faster, which means you don't have to have as large a stomach. Okay, so now what you're going to see is you're going to see that the jaws should get less tough. Okay, and you should also get a smaller stomach. And you should get teeth that are not as strong. All three of those things have happened in our species. Okay? We, we don't see it this way, but our mouths are extraordinarily small for primates. They're, n they're not even remotely close to another, any other primate. So we clearly are an odd, odd man out, not even close. And it's clearly behind the fact that we take small bites and we get a lot of calories out of them. Okay? And we don't have to chew them very hard. It's actually going to turn out that when you look at skulls in Africa, uh, the teeth are great okay, from you know, all through the last several thousand years. And so what's going to happen is, is that that's not true starting you know, a thousand years ago, particularly in Europe. And the reason is, is that it actually requires some stress in order to grow the jaw. And you need the, the, the toughness of the raw food of actually crunching down on it in development in order to make the jaw big enough to support all the teeth that come in. We started using too much processed food in the last thousand years. They started to not stress the jaws of their children. And as a result, their teeth get crowded and then they need braces. Okay? So orthodontia is completely secondary to the fact that human beings have drifted away from their raw food ancestry. You know what I mean? Towards overly processing the food, which is exactly what you see today, okay, and all the problems that you see today. The, um, however, back to the action on, on all your people that are very interested in raw food. So uh, I like to balance this out because as I'm criticizing ultimately uh, the raw food, the raw food uh, thinking, the truth is, is that there's great merit in it. So in other words, the, it's a, the truth winds up being somewhere in the middle. Okay, now, so our species... Uh, began a, 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 an extraordinary odyssey, and that odyssey would be that, that the women would start to dig root vegetables and collect them in a pile at the end of the day and then go to the trouble of lighting a fire. And they learned how to light a fire probably either protecting fires from, uh, from lightning strikes or more likely they started to use flint. Okay, so the, uh, as a result of that, they could cook their food at the end of the day and feed their children. Now, they were eating raw food all day long while they're doing this, but they're also headed towards a large amount of calories at the end of the day in the form of cooked carbohydrate. Now, it's important to remember that because the eating of large amounts of cooked carbohydrate at the end of the day has been found characteristic of every single hunter-gatherer troop in the world. This is, there's no exceptions. Okay, this is human nature. So people, you know, think that oh, shouldn't we be eating, you know, throughout the day, nibbling throughout the day, like our hunter-gatherer ancestors, i.e., eating a bunch of raw food? No, that is not what human beings did. 
Human beings ate the bulk of their calories at the end of the day behind cooked carbohydrate. They've been doing that for two million years before they could talk. Okay? Yeah. Now, and we can tell this why? Because of the, the smallness of the stomach, the weakness of the jaw, the weakness of the teeth, etc. Okay? All of this fits together. Now I want you to picture what must have happened in sub-Saharan Africa when this was happening. What happens is that, that the females are cooking this fire at the end of the day and cooking that food. The problem is that when you do that, other male humans are going to wait around and come and steal the food. There would be nothing to stop them from doing this. Okay? Other animals will stay away because they're afraid of the fire. They actually have instinctual fear because of the smell of fire means a forest fire, and a forest fire means you're dead. So human beings were able to use fire to intimidate other animals away from them, but not other humans. Okay? Other humans were not afraid of the fire because they could use fire as well. So the males would simply sit, sit around and wait for some poor female and then go steal her food. There's nothing that she's going to be able to do about this. So if some male goes up to some bush and sees you know, a fire and then goes through the bush, what's he going to find? He's going to find a female and her three children and a male. He's going to see a male there standing guard there with his spear, like, don't come in here, buddy. I'm going to protect this food. That's the dawn of human pair bonding. Okay. The dawn of human pair bonding is males, bigger, stronger males, protecting the food supply of females. They make a deal. Okay? Now what's going to happen, uh, and that deal is going to be, it's going to enable something that the vegetarian community is not comfortable with, which is that you wind up with a specialization of labor, which is the only time you'll, we've ever seen this in any species on earth. The male becomes specialized at hunting. And the female gathering of, of, the, of the vegetable material. And at the end of the day, she comes and cooks the vegetable material. The male gets a piece of it. He, she's, in fact, a venture capitalist that she supports him that he can take the risk to go out there and hunt. Hunting is very, very risky behavior. You may not be successful for three weeks. You, our species could not afford that until you had fire making more of these root vegetables available. So the female would consistently do this. She cannot hunt because she's got children. She is strictly going to be a gatherer of vegetable material. Human males developed the, uh, the coordination and ability and the upper body musculature uh, uh, to, to throw projectiles in order to kill. And so the, our species then became a species for the first time ever where the, the two adults literally trust each other Okay, that they are bonded and, and the male can know that he's got something to eat at the end of the day that he was going to be able to survive while he goes out there and tries to make a killing. Okay, uh, this is actually still the underlying economic uh, behavior that takes place in males and females in pair bonding today, where the female's job is to get the secure job. Okay, mid level job not anything fancy, make sure that we get the first decent salary, okay? And the male's job is to make a killing in business, okay? It's literally the same psychology. Now, the, uh, it, so what's going to happen, though, is that as that male that's sitting waiting for a fire uh, knows that it's not profitable to go chase that fire, it's profitable if he takes three of his buddies with him. Because if they all go and see that fire, there's only going to be one guy there with a spear, and they'll just overpower or intimidate him, and then they'll take the food anyway, okay? Except that when they push the grass back, they don't see one male with one woman. They see 10 men, a village, okay? So very, very quickly, human beings gathered together in village groups where there would be 20 men or 10 men or 30 men and a whole bunch of females and a whole bunch of children and a whole bunch of fires. And now you get exactly the social organization that we still see today, two million years later. Okay? And we get the very same process where the male's job in the village is to actually go out into the woods and try to get these extraordinary killings where they get thousands of calories with one lucky strike. Where the female's job is to make sure they get the steady plant food. Okay? Now, this species doesn't need meat. It's a Johnny-come-lately addition to the diet. We haven't adapted to needing this at all. 
Well, we've ad adapted to, we can use it, but uh, we've adapted though to the cooking of it, whether it's cooked meat or cooked carbohydrate. The, the cooked food is the big concentrated calories that comes at the end of the day that human beings uh, look forward to and that, that this is where the whole village atmosphere congregates. We still see that this is true. In other words, people still want to, particularly at dinner time, get together with a group of people and eat. And what they want to eat is cooked food. Okay? Now, so what do they do? Now what they've gone has gone overboard. They eat everything cooked. Okay? They, they don't even want to eat an apple anymore because of the effort that it takes to crunch it off of, uh, of, of the apple. They don't want to eat any carrots. They don't want to do anything that might stress their precious little energy in their mouth. Uh, they drink Coca-Cola. In other words, you're seeing what's happening to the species. Um, raw food diets are, are difficult to do. Uh, and it's going to turn out that what people do in raw food diets, in order to mimic the calorie density of, in fact, cooked food, they do a bunch of drying and dehydrating and they process the daylights out of their food with a blender. They use you know, oils. They do all kinds of things. Okay. And that's because what it, in their heart and in their gut, they crave 500 calorie a pound semi processed food, which is what a cooked potato is. Okay. So, what we really want to do is we want to head towards a more McDougal style process. That's really where we're going. And that is, in fact, very consistent with the natural history of the organism. And, um, and if we do that, we wind up with a balance of a lot of raw food in the diet plus the cooked carbohydrate. When we do that, we get the appropriate amount of bites for the amount of calories that you need. Everything works beautifully, and that's how we're designed.